What is history, and why do we study it? I actually have an iconoclastic answer about what is history. It's all the information we have about everything that happened before today. It has no intrinsic shape or form. It's not just a bunch of stories that we've told. It can be anything. And so one of the purposes of my career has been able to say, you know, data or a map is history. And this huge census that doesn't really have a shape to it has a story in it if we can find it. I said that one time to uh, a class, and one of the students raised his hand and said, Oh, Mr. Harris, I thought you liked history. He said, I do, that this is actually about more of the possibilities that it has. So I think that, you know, history is potential stories that we can tell from it. Well, in the same way, I don't know about you, but I'm nothing other than my memories and my experiences. If you took those away, I would just be, you know, blank. Any group of people is only the experiences that they have had. And the power of this, of course, is that people have had different experiences, even in the same nation. So a large part of my work has been to try to gather a way to see all those stories, those memories, those experiences, and interaction. What was that moment, or how do we sort of explain that turn away from just elite-driven versions of history to actually look at populist version of history? You know, obviously, so many folks are at Zen's great work, but even thinking about sort of subaltern studies, like how did that turn happen? Well, I was there when it did uh, as a graduate student watching it. I didn't create it, but by the time I was in graduate school in the late 1970s, it was clear that there were two great revolutions going on. One was the great broadening of history to include the half the population that happened to be female, everybody who was a working person, people of every kind of ethnic minority, people who had been silenced in lots of different ways. It was thrilling to think about how we could expand the story. The other thing that was happening at the same time, which turned out to be a failed revolution, was the quantitative revolution. Well, if you're trying to include all these people who left no records other than the record of their household in the census, how do you write their history? And we thought for a minute that we thought there might be a way to recover their history from the, the data of the past. It turns out that tables and charts aren't really a good way of conveying what history is best at, which is possibility change, sudden swerves, contingency. And so we walked away from it. What I've been working on really for the last 25 years is a way to marry those two revolutions. Let's include everybody in the story and see if we can't find new ways to tell that story. In terms of the field and the discipline, how has Zen's work aged? Everybody and their brother talks about, you know, Howard Zen's work. And I suspect most have not read it. And I'm even more suspicious that most couldn't put him in the proper context. So people in American history who are academics admire Zen's social purpose. But you would not find people who would defend kind of the flatness with which he has written it. It's kind of the same story turned upside down. Columbus used to be great and now it's genocide. Well, or it could have been a more complicated story that was playing out over time. The high school mind loves the thrill of reading Howard Zinn the same way you love, you know, I did hearing the Sex Pistols or whatever, okay? It's, you know, it's, it's rebellion. But the fact is that if you're going to really write a history that does justice to the working people, to the people to whom injustice was inflicted in the past, you're going to have to have a more subtle story than Howard Zinn tells. Now, do I think it's better that we have him than not? Yes, I do. But do I think that that is an adequate substitute for the sort of corporate story that we get in the textbooks? No, we need to find a new way to have people be fully human in the past. Because this also gets, obviously, to history and myth-making, right, and how folks try to create a usable type of history from the past. You know, it obviously happens on the left, it happens on the right, albeit in very different ways in some regards. But what is there the pushback you've gotten in terms of when you're actually trying to demystify history and say, you know what, truth is stranger or perhaps more useful and interesting than mythology? I think people say, well, yeah, that's great, Ed, if everything was as complex uh, as we could possibly make it. But then it kind of falls apart in our hands. Historians are famous for ruining every movie ever made about the past. And I tried just to bite my tongue when some people said, well, what do you think about that? You know, so, and so the trick is, how do we tell a story that's coherent enough, kind of a myth, to have the power of a myth at the same time that it does justice to the record? And, you know, I do believe, ironically, that fiction and film may be better ways of doing that myth-making than history. I, I think history is fundamentally an inquisitive medium. 
you know, that's it's kind of self-questioning. Well, if we're looking at evidence, I bet there's more evidence that would cut against the grain on all this. So I think it's, uh, in many ways, what I've been trying to do for a long time is to have a passionate history that is still a complicated history. How do you do that? How do you work yourself up? And the answer is empathy. You know, the book that I just published recently has a lot about Abraham Lincoln in it, but in many ways it focuses on what he was up against. The thing is, was Lincoln a racist? Yes or no? You know, was he the great emancipator? Yes or no? Or was he up against 48% of white Northern men who would not vote for him even in 1864? He was able to persuade almost no one to change their vote from the Democrats to the Republicans in the great crisis of the nation. That gives you some idea that it wasn't just a matter of his personal character. It was the terrain he had to cross. So I think if we complicate the situation in which people navigate, I think it it actually makes the story more powerful. But we have to be very careful and very determined to tell it in as compelling a way as we can. As a historian who studied the South, who studied Reconstruction, the Civil War, these questions of empathy, social change and the like, the color line, how do you try to make sense of this moment with the rise of Donald Trump in terms of the long view of American history? My instinct is, is that we are at the beginning of a new progressive era in American history, and that what we are seeing is a great unveiling of a lot of structures of power that have been implicit in connections, uh, compromises that have been in place. And now you look around, you see whether it's in the Me Too movement or in the Women's March or in number of people running for office under the Democratic banner. I think that what you're seeing is a great mobilization of people who had been complacent under the Obama 